All right. So I think we will go ahead and get started. I'm sure people will be joining along the way. Um, but to everyone who's just joined us, my name is Sarah Bell Selig. I am with Catalyst Press. I'm the head of the South African office based here in Cape Town. Um, and we've also got our, our publisher with us and our publicist in New York and in Texas. And we have a wonderful panel lined up today for Reading Africa. This is our second event of the week. It's a really exciting time of year when we get to celebrate everything about um, African literature that we know and love. So um, yeah, today's theme, we'll be talking about um, climate fiction and how African writers are dealing with the climate crisis. And we've got an amazing lineup of people. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have them chat for about 50 minutes. And then at the end, we will open it up for some audience Q&A for about 10 to 15 minutes as well. Um, so if you've got a question along the way, make sure that you drop it in the chat at the bottom and we'll address it during that time. So I do wanna say this event is uh, co-hosted by Sarah Robin Farrell of the African Climate Alliance. Unfortunately, she is sick, so she is not able to join us today. So I'm representing for the both of us. But the African Climate Alliance is a youth-led organization that um, advocates for Afrocentric climate justice. So it's very relevant to today's conversation. You can check out their amazing programming on their social media pages, on their websites. They're doing really big things. Um, so yeah, definitely make sure you check them out. So I'm going to keep this super brief. Today's conversation is going to be moderated by the wonderful Bridget Pitt, who is with us. Bridget is a South African environmental and human rights activist, as well as an author of four amazing novels, including I, Brother Horn, which we at Catalyst Press had the privilege of publishing earlier this year. Um, Bridget, thank you so much for moderating today's conversation. So I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to you if that works for you. That's great. Thanks so much, Sarah. And um, I've been so excited about this discussion. I think it's a really great lineup and obviously it's such a relevant topic for all of us. Um, I'm just going to start by introducing everybody. I just want to apologize in advance if I get some of the Nigerian names a little bit off. Uh, I will do my best to pronounce them correctly. Um, but we do have a wonderful panel. I'm going to start with Chanelo and Walu. Um, she is a Nigerian editor and author of speculative fiction. She's a co-founder of Amanana magazine, which pub publishes speculative fiction by writers from Africa and the diaspora. And she is currently the nonfiction editor of Anathma magazine. Her works have appeared in Uncanny magazine, Slate magazine, and Strange Horizons. She is a nominee of the NOMA Awards, British Science Fiction Award, and Short Story. Dory Day Africa Award and a finalist for the 2021 Ignite Award for the Community Award category was Andrew Wilmot. Her short story, What the Dead Man Said, was listed by Tor.com as one of the five best post a apocalyptic and dystopian stories by African authors and was selected by one of the best science fiction and fantasy books of 2019 by the Washington Post. So big welcome to Chanelo. Um, then we have Dr. Utechukwe Peter Umezurika, a Nigerian author of short fiction, poetry, and children's fiction, which is great, um, who is currently an assistant professor of English at the University of Calgary. His academic research draws from gender studies and critical race theory to analyze African, African diaspora, post-colonial, and global literatures. He was one of the winners of the Commonwealth Short Story Competition in 2006 and 2008, and has twice been shortlisted for the Nigeria Prize for Literature. He was awarded the Nigeria Prize for Literary Criticism in 2022, and was the inaugural recipient of the University of Calgary's Provost's Postdoctoral Awards for Indigenous and Black Scholars. He's the co-editor of Reads for a Wayfarer, an anthology of poems and has published a poetry book and a manuscript under review about masculinity in Nigerian novels. Um, then we have Hilon Habila Ngalabak, a Nigerian novelist and poet whose writing has won many prizes, including the Kane Prize, the Commonwealth Writers Prize for African Region, the Emily Balfe Prize and the Wyndham Campbell Prize for Fiction. His novels include Travelers, Waiting for an Angel, Measuring Time, and Oil on Water. The last is a hard-hitting indictment of the oil industry in Nigeria. 
His book reviews have been published by The Guardian and New York Books, amongst others. He has curated and edited the Granter book of the African short story in 2011 and the NW14 anthology of new writing. He is currently acting as a creative writing professor at the George Mason University. Dee Laguala is a compatriot, a feminist facilitator, researcher, creative chameleon, and a multidisciplinary storyteller. Her writing has been published in Our Ghosts Were Once People, Feminism Is, and This Is How It Is. Dila is currently working on a documentary about an ocean scientist who is also Sangoma. In 2022, she edited a short film called Untitled, which was screened in Cape Town. And in 2023, she edited a film called Surprise, which will be screened at the Congo Film Festival in Kinshasa. A proposal for a documentary on climate change was accepted for development by the Generation Africa program. So she is clearly a filmmaker as much as a writer. And Nelson Rowland is a Black Hispanic writer based in Ohio. His debut novelette, Saudade, was published in Fire magazine of Black speculative fiction and reprinted in Lightspeed magazine and was mentioned in the best American science fiction and fantasy in 2019. So welcome to everybody. I think it's a, a really great group that we have. Um, what I'm going to do is I've got some questions which I will direct it at each writer in turn. Um, but if others want to sort of jump in and respond, then please uh, indicate by raising your hands. So Helon, we're going to start with you. Um, I read a review of your, your latest novel by Bernadine Evaristo, when she said, the most powerful and interesting character in the story proves to be the fetid viscous menacing landscape i certainly found this to be true it was extremely powerful but i was also struck by the intimate and traumatic relationship between the local people and the landscape i'm interested to know from you how you think characterizing the earth as a living being with agency and subjectivity subverts the co colonialist agenda and do you think that casting the land as a protagonist is an essential element in narratives about climate change or ecological injustice. Um, thank you, Bridget, for your question. Um, yeah, and also thanks to the organizers for organizing this important um, discussion um, event and greetings to all my co-panelists. Um, and slight correction, actually, Oil and Water is not my latest book. It's It was published in 2011. My latest was published in 2019, Travelers. So it's before, you know, the penultimate latest, I, I will call it. Yeah. And to your question about uh, making the earth, the landscape, um, the, the, the locale, um, a protagonist, in the in the in the book, I think um, is super important um, because that that's that's what the whole book is about. That that's that's the focus of the book to bring the attention of the reader to what's happening in the environment, um, the agenda of the oil companies to make as much profit as they can um, from from the land taking and taking and never giving back anything and in the process totally degrading and devastating the environment. So the challenge for a writer is how do you do that? How do you um, highlight the environment? How do you um, make the reader see all these things without preaching to the reader, without appearing to, 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 to be sermonizing, you know, to be writing a pamphlet? How do you make it into a story? So as a writer, these are the challenges I think that are facing um, that are facing you as soon as you sit down to write about the environment. And you can see different writers have risen to these challenges in their different ways, but the end result is always, always to highlight the degradation of the environment and to kind of historicize it as much as possible, which was what I was trying to do. And you mentioned colonialism. So historicizing for me is to show that um, these things are not just happen in a they're not happening in a vacuum. 
there's a kind of systematic linkage when you look at the, the, the current destruction of the environment. It goes back to colonialism when you look at what was happening in the Congo, other parts of Africa, all these things. Colonialism was just set up to come and take as much resources from Africa as much as possible without caring about the, the, the human beings or the environment and all that. So you could say that was the original um, moment when this disregard for the environment began. It's linked to colonialism. So that's that, that that's you know the things that I was trying to show in in my book. The multinational corporations basically started after colonialism. So there was no end to colonialism. We're actually in one long stretch, a continuum, where the official governmental structures of colonialism ended, the multinational corporations kind of stepped in and continued from there. And it's the same agenda. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, that's that's what I was trying to show in my book. Yeah. I mean, I think you do that very powerfully. And, and I think also the kind of difference in relationship between the people who were living in that Delta area and their connection with the land and their willingness, um, sometimes at considerable cost, to try and protect the land um, in some instances and in other instances, they were kind of seduced by the, the flares and the, the sort of immediate promise of wealth. Um, but the difference between that connection, you know, people who are connected to the land, who, who recognize what it brings to them compared to the, the sort of oil, you know, the ba oil barons from across the waters from overseas, who just see it as a as a place to exploit, who see it as a kind of inert object that is just there for their self enrichment. I, th I think you communicated that very powerfully. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That that was the point to show this kind of almost spiritual link between the human being and the land. Um, that's always been the African way. Um, in a in a little chapter in the book. I, I tried to show this um, little community that was um, almost untouched by this 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 crumble for the oil wealth, and they tried to resist. And I tried to again historicize and show that these people have always been custodians of the land, and they understand what the land means to them, and they try to resist. And when you look at it, it's not just in Africa; other cultures have that. Traditional cultures always have this respect for the land and what it means and they revere it some of them try to even worship it you know because of this belief that every part of our environment has its own kind of um spiritual essence so i try to show that in that book that that the people understand what the land means and what the environment is not a new thing you know that we're being preached to by all these, you know, so-called progressive organizations, it's always been there. We just have to find a way of kind of articulating it. And I think that's the duty of the writer and even the activist, you know, from Africa to try to articulate and show the, 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 the foreign activists as well as the Africans to remind the Africans that it's always been our way. It's not a new thing. We've always had it and we should kind of just reimagine it. And, and and to kind of continue where our ancestors kind of stopped. Yeah, I think that's very interesting because I think it's speaking about a kind of activism which goes beyond just a kind of, you know, very angry protesting activism. I, I think it goes to an activism that is about uh, reaffirming connection um, and and reaffirming hum humanity, which which in itself is, a, is an act of, Subversion in in the context where you know so much connection to the land and humanity is is denied, and I'd like to to use this to to move into a discussion with Chinelo. Um, Chinelo, you explore many forms of violence in your story, um, as of course Helan does. Um, you explore the violence done to the land by climate change, but you also more explicitly, I'm talking about the story, what the dead man said, you also more explicitly explore sexual violence. Um, 
And what I, I liked about your story, but also found challenging, is that you you kind of walk on the edge of the potential for redemption and healing. So your story addresses the violence. It also addresses the attempts to heal this violence, both in the land, in, in the kind of your descriptions of, of redeeming the land, but also in that conversation with the protagonist and her father in trying to heal the, the violence she experienced experience as a young person. I'm interested to know in, you know, whether you feel that stories about violence should be redemptive, or whether you think it's a matter of, of just kind of unpacking that violence, expressing that violence, and just acknowledging it and sitting with the pain of it. What, what, what role do you think redemption plays in such stories? Hmm. I suppose it's um, it goes to what you consider redemption to be. I think sometimes people think of redemption and forgiveness as interchangeable, as sort of like if we just if you achieve redemption somehow everything that has gone before is wiped clean, and now we can all you know hold hands and you know skip into the sunset singing, you know songs of praise um i think anyone who has experienced the violence of uh, violence of any kind is is a tool of coercion and control right and anyone who has experienced that knows intimately that it doesn't leave you even even after you have moved away and and you know, um, started a new or whatever. And I think it's the same thing when we're talking about um, attempts to reclaim, um, say, lands and practices and um, spaces and histories that have been subject to violence. Um, Helen talked about colonialism as an ongoing project, that it hasn't stopped, it hasn't, it didn't go away. And I tend to lean towards the side of optimism and um i i it might make me sometimes people assume that there's a naivete to that but i i i consider that even if everything goes right and i like to think that there's much more potential for that to happen than for the other um we often discount you know the potential for things to go right because we're so hyper focused on the things that might go wrong um i mean we have our little like hunter gatherer brains and it's designed to do that but um but even if everything goes right how do we still reckon with the legacies that we've been left with right how do we still find ways to heal um and so i think when we talk about redemption i think we need to be clear that redemption is not the same as forgetting it's not the same as erasure and i think mm -hmm. sometimes there is an um an expectation that in order to achieve redemption or to find redemption we have to pretend like the past never happened i think my stories are fundamentally um utopian in nature in that it, it is striving hopefully for something better out of the ashes it's striving for something that is more whole something that is um, nourishing, restorative. Um, and I believe, honestly, that these are things that can be found even, even in the darkest spaces. Um, mm -hmm. It does require a willingness, though, to reckon with the difficult things, the difficult aspects. And I think sometimes we we think that if we get to a, like a future that is positive then somehow all the yeah. bad, somehow all the things that make us human and flawed and, you know, shitty to each other will just magically disappear. And that's yeah. not the case. And so even in the midst of reclamation and healing, I think that it is important for us to not forget the, um, the horrors that brought us to where we are. Yeah, I, I think you do that very well in the story um, because, you know, there's a sense of this this land regenerating. 
um, and a people regenerating, but there's there's also a strong sense of the grief and loss that predated that regeneration. Um, and I think what also interested me is that your protagonist, her conversation is with her dead father, not with a living father. Um, and it's not clear whether you know, the dead father actually manifested and had this conversation with her, or whether it was a conversation she needed to have, but in fact had to manifest herself because her father had died and she could no longer, you know, that conversation with him was no longer possible. So it was a sort of form of self-healing, which I think is very powerful. Um, but I was just, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, what your thoughts were around that. I think it's ambiguous for a reason because I'm not sure it's I'm not sure there is an answer to it. You know, um, the I I just finished. Um, I'm in the process actually of co-editing um, an anthology of African ghost stories, and um, it's been so interesting to me to see how um, indigenous African spiritualities have approached the understanding of death life before life after and and how we um how we relate to that and i what i found super interesting about that project has been the realization that um what we often when we are talking about the dead and about the ghosts and about pasts we are often reckoning with our present sins at the same time and there are so many stories in which um, the harms that you have done to others, to your lands, to your, um, to you know those who are more vulnerable, those who are weaker, return to you in various forms, um, so that you can. I I don't want to say like make amends actually so that you can you can make recompense so that there is justice and so many stories um i had a super interesting conversation with um nigerian writer toby ogundira about what it is that scares us uh and when i look at what scares people in western context is often that the things that that they have done will now be done to them so the idea that like someone from far away will come and genocide us as we genocided, you know, indigenous populations. Some, um, someone will come and spread a disease to us as we did in these spaces. Um, someone will come and displace us from our homes. But when you look at the, the horrors in a lot of African contexts, it's the idea that in disregarding the ways that nourished us the ways that that kept us in balance we will then reap the um the uh consequences of that whether in the form of a vengeful god or goddess or deity whether in the form of you know exploited women who have been trapped in you know amulets and objects coming free to like take back the wealth that they they brought you you know stories like that and so i think when we are talking about dealing with ghosts i don't think that there is a functional difference between the ghosts that we create and the ghosts that are um i'm not sure it matters whether whether it is a generation of her own you know grief adult um, imagination or whether it's real what has to happen has to happen in mm -hmm. some ways so yeah, I think that, that is that's really interesting. Um and I think it it goes on to my next question with Dila. Um uh Dila, in your essay in feminism is, and I think in, in other contexts as well, um you speak about the driving force of rage in empowering action. Um I mean you, you know, like Tanella, you also deal with with the, the issue of sexual violence and you know also from the point of view of your own experience of it um and you quote the famous Maya Angelou remark that you know about using your anger and writing it and painting it and dancing it and so on 
but but you also speak about um how that anger has led to a certain amount of burnout and sadness and your need to seek compassionate radicalism i think is how you phrase it as a more sustainable and self-nurturing force for change um and i'm interested in how this applies not only to sexual violence but also to the violence that is part of climate change um and of course you know a number of commentators have, have noted the intersection between climate change and sexual violence and sort of gender-based violence generally so just the the role of that that kind of balancing of of this anger and compassionate radicalism in response to those um forms of of social and ecological injustice i'm just sorry is dila here yes i'm i'm here uh, sorry you can't see me <laughs> I, I, I wasn't seeing you okay no that's glad. <laughs> glad yeah so just interested to hear your response to those thoughts I think in in that particular essay, I was talking about especially activist burnout um, and rage as like a catalyst emotion, but what happens when that rage becomes grief. Um, and I think that's very much connected to something you see with the climate crisis as um, some people have phrased as climate depression or climate anxiety, where there's like a, a sense of despair um, after sort of the, the catalyzed catalyzed like um sort of spark of like seeking change um so i think there's a there's a connection there like one of the things that we're going to have to face is that deep sense of grief and the depression and the anxiety that is um like dealing with something that feels insurmountable um and i think that's trauma across board across the board whether it's personal trauma or historical trauma or um, the trauma of living in times that feel apocalyptic. Um, and yeah, beyond, yeah, the compassionate, um, it's like radical compassion was this concept of bringing the political into sort of conversations that are often happen in spiritual spaces, which are conversations around kindness and caregiving. Um, and coming in feminist spaces, there's discussions about sort of feminist care. Um, but I found during that specific time that political activism wasn't making space for the idea of concepts such as like community care or compassion that you find in spiritual spaces. Um, so I think with activist struggles across the board, um, which are obviously intersectional and all interrelated and you can't deal with one without the other, the famous Audre Lorde um, quote about, um, yeah, oppression being sort of a multi-headed issue. Um, yeah, I think just the concept of community care and what does that mean? And thinking through, what people have said previously about um, healing and our ideas around um, the ancestral. I'm also interested in how ancestral spirituality and that understanding is tied to how we view our environment, but how we view things like community care, compassion, um, and dealing with things that come from a capitalist society that makes everything an individual issue. And I think that individualizing of the issue has led to a sense of helplessness that's tied to stuff like climate anxiety and climate depression. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. yeah, I think that's very interesting because I think it, it echoes a little bit of what Helon was talking about with the, the spiritual connection to the land, um, which is in a sense accentuates in some ways the kind of grief that is linked to to climate change and to the ecological destruction because you have this you know if you have that connection to the land you're obviously going to feel much more acutely um the sorrow of of its destruction but in a way it also perhaps 
enables you to it, it perhaps gives you the the kind of spiritual nurturing that you need um to withstand what is happening i don't know am i making sense that is it's a kind of double-edged thing it, it, it sort mm -hmm. of brings more grief but also brings more um strengthening mm -hmm. i think a conversation I had with someone last night where she talked about like grief is the other face of love. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that's popping into my head now. And I think you're right, like a, a deeper connection and an understanding that um, nature and human in individuals are not separate things will make you feel things more acutely. Um, but I think it will provide a sense of responsibility and a sense of ancestral connection a sense of community that um makes you feel like there is an a chance that we may survive this i think so many people with activism across the board have said turning to community during times of crisis pretty much allows you to feel that grief without being completely overcome um and again without that um complete fall into despair um so I, I think you're exactly right it's it's both sides it's mm -hmm. both like the the other side of the coin of love which is deep grief but also an ability to overcome yeah. yes and, it, and maybe it's something to do with stepping away from that kind of very individualized notion you know that you you've got to be the savior of the world um, and recognizing that you are part of a community or part of a, a kind of ancestral history or, or part of the earth. Um, I, I mean, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, that that idea that that we are nature defending itself, um, that we we're all actually part of 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 this thing. We're not just individuals kind of fighting something that sometimes feels horribly powerful, but we part of a much deeper more powerful life force um which i think sometimes is can be quite necessary to access uh that sense just to to give yourself the the kind of strength to keep going um i think while we're on the topic of of grief what i'd like to do is um is just turn to um sorry i've, I've lost my connection with my mouse here um but I just wanted to turn to Nelson here um and to talk about the story of Saudad um so I believe this is a Portuguese word which roughly translates into the English word for nostalgia or, or for longing of something that is absent um and Nelson, I, I was wondering whether this word in, in the context of the discussion we're having here is might be linked to the, the sort of newly coined term of sostalgia, um, which is the the grief that is felt by the the sort of disappearing landscapes and the, the loss of biodiversity and the um common kind of loss of, of a stable climate. Um and and the longing for an earth that 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 was once we took for granted in a sense, and as we're realizing is is kind of vanishing before our eyes. Um, and I, I'm thinking this particularly as the the central pro protagonist in the story, Vida, uh, like other black and brown people in the futuristic world that you created, um, was exiled to Venus. Uh, so I've just you know I'd just like to to ask you a little bit more about the, the meaning of that, that word that you chose as the title for the story, and also how your choice of having people of color exiled from earth, how is that a reflection of the kind of contemporary violence, um, race, racially based violence that, that, that has happened and has happened historically? Um, and how did that choice, you know, for you, serve as a kind of commentary as to what is going on at the moment 
Thank you, Bridget. I'm glad you asked. Uh, it's been a while since I've written it, but uh, for full context, uh, I work for Phi Literary Magazine of Black Speculative Fiction now. Um, I'm the sponsor coordinator there, uh, tech assistant there, kind of do a lot of things which don't fit into a title really. Um, but before that, I did submit a story to Fire. It was for their pilgrimage issue. And, you know, certainly attaching a word to pilgrimage and then writing a story about it was um, the concept for that. And one moment. My room has a timed light. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the idea um, for the story was a bit of a reverse pilgrimage, really. Um, so as you said, black and brown people on the planet were exiled to other worlds. Um, in the context of the story, we're talking a little bit about, you know, some of the corporate machinations that you see today as far as um, exploring, mining, exploiting. So um, in the context of that story, we were also like fresh off of like the 2016 election in America of Donald Trump. Um, so uh, feelings of, you know, xenophobia, statements about dirty Africans and stuff came up in American political discourse. Um, so a lot of the context for that story was set in that time period of, okay, we're going to mine other planets and send people out there. Um, you know, unfortunately, the people who a lot of the uh, wealthy Western world considers as, you know, misfortunate anyway to go and uh, manipulate other planets and extract resources from them. Um, Saudaji is an interesting word for me personally. So I'm Black Hispanic. My uh, mother is from the Dominican Republic. Uh, black, you know, I I did not consider myself Black growing up because that wasn't how we were talked about as a Hispanic person, but that's something like you uncover um, as you develop. Other people call you Black. You realize you're Hispanic, but obviously your roots extend way, way, way back into the, the, the motherland, the home continent of Africa. So in the story Saudaji, uh, I considered it a reverse pilgrimage for Vida because she's not from Earth and her immediate ancestors are not from Earth. And so she wanted to go back to her home country of Brazil for people who speak Portuguese, people of her language and background. Um, but even then, um, and I kind of experienced this personally myself, um, the feeling of needing to return to like some sort of state of nature before industrialization, before you know the European continents industrialized and took over and enslaved and transported people. Um, even that's like a false pilgrimage of sorts. Like nowadays we envy for a world that a lot of us have never experienced in the first place. Um, so for someone like Vida and myself who, you know, years and years later, we're talking um, centuries after the slave trade, you know, someone like Vida from Brazil, um, her ancestors would have touched African soil. But by the time you reach several generations into the future, we're kind of grasping at a history we never had in the first place. You'd have to go way back in order to like have a nostalgia for that. So, you know, for me, Saudaji was kind of a, encapsulates a, a wistfulness for like a ghost of the past. Like, and even um, for most of us here, I assume um, that idyllic, Garden of Eden conception of like, you know, Africa. Um, some people have that. Some people are certainly more grounded in how far back we go before we imagine ourselves in harmony with nature before European conquerors came in. Um, but for people in the deep future in my story who were of space, essentially, um, they're reaching for something like a homeland back on earth, but even then their homeland wasn't the place where they came from. Um, kind of relates to my own experience. Like I said, uh, blackness was not something I was introduced to until um, I matured and grew up and, and interacted with other black people who, you know, 
obviously saw that my different ethnic and cultural background were Hispanic, but it's like, no, at the end of the day, we are the same. And that's not something that's taught a lot in um, some Hispanic cultures. Like, you know, you kind of separate yourself as something other than being Black. Um, so a lot of people in my background, like, contend with that. Um, the kind of colorism that arises from having a different culture and being from a different continent. Um, so yeah, so Daoji for me was very much, it's the wish for a thing you probably never had in the first place. Um, but it, it's obviously for all of us, we're still tied and connected to the earth, but you know, we're kind of bastard children at this point. Um, we don't, often have direct ties to the animism that like animates uh we we had the discussion earlier about um many native peoples from many different continents have the concept of like, like being tied to the earth and living more harmoniously with it um for someone like Vida and a lot of people who were exchanged through the slave trade and in the story eventually transported to space to do the same thing um you're kind of grasping for you know, the ghost of a, a past that doesn't really exist for you, but, you know, deep in your DNA and ancestry, it's there, um, but it, it's like a false sense of home for you. We, we just didn't have that experience. I hope that answers some of your question. Yeah, I, I, well, I think it's such a kind of complex area, um, and I think, I think people are very focused on it now um, because because the earth as we know it is is kind of disappearing um and and people are, are starting to really kind of question you know as you say there's still some indigenous cultures who live in in very close um connection with the earth but but most people are urbanized have, been, have moved have been moved have been taken away um so that connection is is perhaps more in the realms of imagination than in the lived reality but i think it's very relevant to the climate change issues um, right now. And I would like to just move on to Uche, who um, has released a short story collection called Double Wahala, Double Tr Trouble, which talks a little, uh, quite, uh, you know, has a lot of stories about mi migrants and migration. And one of the reviewers um, commented that the collection take on the rich concepts of home and belonging, home lost and regained, Home created with others and with the land. Home is anywhere we find something to love. Um, and I think this this issue has become so immensely pertinent um, in our current era, where in a, in a way migration and exile seem to be almost an inevitable consequence of the violence of colonialization. You know, sometimes literally um, through through the, the slave trade, people were physically removed, but in other contexts where the conditions were unlivable, the conditions have been created by colonization leading to a kind of forced migration. Um, and this of course has been massively compounded with the um, onset of climate change and the kind of catastrophes that, that, that people are finding, are experiencing, which is, is driving migration. So Uchi, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how how you see this search for home, um, how you see writers as engaging with with the search for home and with how how migration is being driven by climate change. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bridget, and uh, thank you for those wonderful insights uh, from Helen, Chinelo, Della, and Nelson. And I think I've I've taken lots of notes. And because I find them very enriching and uh, profound. So just in case I come up with a paper and then I reference some of these words, know that I'm acknowledging all the beautiful uh, words you've just shared on this amazing platform. So uh, essentially the work you are referring to uh, is my, so there are two, two works here, the collection of short stories which uh, dealt with the ubiquity of troubles in Nigeria. Like most Nigerians would know, uh, <clears throat> the everyday experience of just being in Nigeria is fraught with so many challenges, so many avoidable uh, misnomers. 
And uh, so the, the other one is my poetry collection, which came about because I currently live in Canada. And it was a way for me to grapple with this, uh, to, to, to draw from Nelson's uh, comments, this sort of nostalgia, this longing for home, even though I'm trying to recreate a home in Canada, but of course I'm still beholden to my native homeland, which is Nigeria. So th the book was my way to really understand, to come to terms with the possibility that home is nowhere at this point in my life for me, uh, because I, uh, I'm, I'm still undecided if I should call uh, Canada home and uh, what that might seem like if I decide to call Canada home. So there's this sort of uh, going back and forth with, back and forth between my ideal of what home is and then my reality of what home was. And so I, one other thing to note was that when I came to Canada, the it was almost at the height of, well, not really at the height, so many Africans who were crossing the Sahara Desert and then the, the Mediterranean Sea, they were drowning. And one of those uh, news reports and images that really shook me was when uh, I saw the casket of 11 Nigerian girls being displayed in Italy. I think they must have, their boat must have capsized off the coast of Lampedusa or any of those uh, Greek or Italian coasts. So, and I saw that photo of these girls, they, they, their corpses being uh, displayed in Italy, far from home. And that really got me into a, a not too nice space where I started thinking about political dysfunction, political apathy, and then what, what is happening with Africa as a continent and why this failure to, to care, how, how can we incorporate care into governance? How can our governments in, in, in Nigeria, in Ivory Coast, in wherever, whichever parts of Africa can care more for its citizens and by extension care for the earth? Because in as much as my poetry deals with migrations and then the difficulties of being a migrant or an immigrant elsewhere or in a place you are you are considering calling home, it's also about environmental issues. Because in this collection, I also dwelt on uh, the devastation of the Niger Delta uh, region. I'm from an oil producing uh, community in Imo State, so I. I <laughs> You have multinational oil corporations exploiting and exploring more land for, for oil capitalism. So it was also uh, my way of really thinking about how this plunder is continuing, even though I'm no longer within that community. And incidentally or coincidentally, I live in Alberta, which is also an oil producing uh, province or state in Canada. So I was trying to like bring these two, uh, Nigeria being an oil producing country and then Alberta being an oil producing uh, state to put both of them in conversation and then see how I can really bring that uh, awareness into uh, a global space or a space that cuts across continent and so that's my own. I can speak for other writers how they they are dealing or uh, negoti negotiating with questions of home, but poetry has really afforded me uh, an opening to really think about the 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 stability and of course the instability of a concept such as home. So I'll just leave that out there for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bridget. Yeah, I think it's I think what you're talking about with the, the issue of oil is so interesting because um you know there's a lot of focus on the 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 destruction that is caused by climate change and by the burning of fossil fuels. 
Um, but I think what, what's so important is to always remember the, the destruction that has been caused by the extraction of fossil fuels. Um, you know, if you look at a country like Nigeria, where that delta has been so um, heavily impacted and, and, I mean, you know, communities absolutely traumatized by, by how that's played out over the years. Um, in South Africa, you know, we're also experiencing that. I've, I've just written an essay about the coal mining in, in northern KZN where, you know, activists have been intimidated and killed and, and just seeing how it plays out that communities are so fragmented. Um, and that violence has been done to communities over, over decades. Um, and that's precisely what has enabled the conditions for the ongoing exploitation uh, of those spaces because the custodians of those spaces have been so traumatized, so fragmented, um, you know, bought off or sold off or, or just eliminated if, if they kind of, you know, are in the way. So I think it's it's also an important thing for writers to consider is, is exploring the, that issue. Um, I think, guys, we haven't got a lot of time left. Hopefully, we we we'll, we can have some indulgence from our audience and go a little over time. I've still got quite a few questions for you guys, but I think perhaps we should just see if there are any questions from from those who who are tuning in. Um, we can maybe, um, Sarah, are we are we doing this through the meeting chat or are people raising hands? How how are we going to take questions? I think um, if any of the audience members do have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, I think it's okay if we go a few minutes over, Bridget, if you want to do kind of maybe one last question and we give the audience some time to type in any questions, if that works for you. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, okay, I think one of the things that, that's interesting me, it's, I mean, there's so many things that have come up in, in the discussion. Uh, so far that I think any one of those we could really, you know, spend quite a long time on. Um, but one of the things that's that's been of concern to me recently is is a particular form of quite insidious sort of neocolonialism, um, which is playing out in the form of carbon trading. So that what we've had recently, I, I think we're all aware that COP28 is is being held in UAE at the moment. Um, and there's a UAE company called Blue Carbon, which has recently bought up massive forests across Africa, apparently land in the size of sort of nearly the size of the United Kingdom altogether. And the idea of buying up these forests is, you know, to form a kind of carbon offset. So basically, they will protect the forest from logging and then they will sell to the companies that invest them, they'll sell these carbon offsets so those companies can then carry on churning out um, fossil fuels. And the UAE itself has made it very clear that it intends to keep burning fossil fuels well beyond 2050, which completely goes into the face of, of science. Um, so I'm just interested in you know, the complexity of, of this kind of new form of colonialism and what kind of challenges that that poses for writers or commentators on on climate change and particularly climate change in the context of Africa. Um, I don't know whether there are any, I mean, I think anybody who's interested in answering that question can jump in here. So um, <clears throat> I find the concept very interesting because um, I've done in, as my, in a former life as a journalist, I did a lot of research on um, climate solutions and, um, and how that has been capitalized. And there is um, a very interesting um, series of, of articles that I came across talking about, um, for instance, one one aspect of the research I did for um, a documentary film in, back in 2012 called Nowhere to Run um, looked at climate um, climate change in Nigeria specifically, 
and there was one aspect I came across which was a um, conservation area that has been curated by an oil company so it's this like small area of land in um, in the Niger Delta that has been exclusively set aside by this oil company um, as it sort of give back to the community program the the plot the area in question is i'd say the size of like a golf course <laughs> um it's beautiful it's it's well curated it's lovely but the local population is not allowed to enter into that space um they're not allowed to um to hunt there they're not allowed to harvest there they're not allowed physically actually barred um there were lots of cases where a local population complained of like you know um security agents kind of going in and beating people up and like uh, intimidating them and, and and this is in the context of a, a multinational oil company which right across you know the water has this like giant belching factory that's like spewing you know off gas into the air and and so for me it was such a stark and visual expression of this sort of <laughs> shell game that we are being pl you know played um i i the same concept goes for you know green investing and um i have edited a report that talked about how green investing is also another shell game in which you know there are no real targets there's no real um system of like knowing how much actual good these these you know companies and projects are doing but it becomes this way of sort of um uh wearing the robe of community and, and environmental care while still continuing to maintain business as usual and so when i look at the excitement at say electric cars you know it's it's really about focusing us on the surface and not and and not asking us to question the systems under which this surface thing is built and so there's no question about changing underlying structures because too many people benefit from it but we need but but about doing the minimum to keep from having everything blow up in your face so um I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure how, like, for me as a writer, I'm not sure how that has entered into my own writing yet, because it's still something that, um, you know, I'm thinking about and grappling with in my own head. Um, but I, I do, I do see how it is, it is just, you know, a mask, it is just a veneer. Um, and I think many of us are, are, are also dealing with that and expressing that in our, in our writing. So, um, that, that's sort of one one place to come. I, I come at it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, I think, just yeah. to kind of add to yes. that. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's just interesting, the, the COP28, um, what's happening there. And even the ones before that, how essentially we are reaching a point where they are not creating any solutions. They are just creating more problems. When you look at the fact that there are more oil lobbyists going to these meetings than even activists, it just become ridiculous. There's just nothing happening. So that's, that's one thing you have to begin to, to, to acknowledge. And then the whole question of um, buying land in Africa just so that they can get some kind of carbon credit. You know, this is just a kind of imaginary concept, you know, of they're not addressing the root problem, like Chinole you know, just said, of stopping the exploitation and the use of fossil fuel. We all know that that's the solution. But no, what they're saying is that they are going to keep producing fossil fuel because that's what their economy depends on. And then they create this imaginary solution of buying land in Africa and then maintaining that land as some kind of, they become custodians of the land. The whole problem is when you look at the, the meaning of land um, to, to Africans, when you go back to pre-colonial days, 
the idea of owning land, you cannot own land. The African the individual cannot own land. It's always a communal property. So for you to even come to a country and own land, which goes against everything, you know, that has to do with our tradition, that you cannot own land. So then we look at another aspect of it, where if you own this land, that means you can stop Africans from encroaching. You know, we're going back to the colonial paradigm of keeping Africans out and just kind of creating this, this preferential space for these people who are not living in the country, but they own it and they can stop you from using it, from burying your debt on it, from, from doing anything that, that you usually do on this land. That is just crazy when you look at it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's just, it's another form of exclusion, um, you know, which is, which is actually unfortunately characterized a lot of the, the kind of conservation efforts in Africa have, have been an extension of colonialism, um, you know, with the, the, the kind of game parks that were initially declared were often uh, kind of forced people out of, out of the area and excluded people from the area. And, you know, so those relationships of exclusion are, are continuing. And again, it's a radical disruption of people's relationship with land. Whereas it's precisely that relationship that needs to be healed for us to have any kind of prospect of going ahead. Um, but I think what's interesting is how writers were so critical to the, the whole sort of challenge of colonialism, you know, in, in the 50s and 60s and those kind of early challenges um, <clears throat> against colonial mindsets and against the psychology of colonialism. And I think, I think. African writers are particularly positioned to to really challenge what's the kind of neocolonialism that is going on in this particular insidious form. Um, so, I mean, again, that's that's a, a, a big topic which we could talk about a lot longer. Um, but there are a couple of questions that I just want to uh, throw open to the panel. Bridget. Um... Uh, yes. Go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to add to this conversation before we move yes. on, especially considering, I guess, the point that you made, and I think um, your channel made as well about neocolonial neo -colonial ideas of conservation. Um, I guess not as a writer, but as a filmmaker, the film I'm currently making about the ocean scientist who's also a spiritual yes. healer, a sangoma, her work is tied to small scale fishing communities. Um, who have often been pushed out of um, spaces where they fish for the sake of marine protected areas. Um, and those marine protected areas will push out communities that have been using those spaces sustainably. And sort of the big rigs that can fish offshore are allowed to continue to exploit, um, yeah, without any sort of consequence. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that as a, a case study for exactly what you're saying and how so much of South Africa's history of national parks is tied to the idea of forced removals, especially of, of Black people um, who've been using um, land in a way that is sacred and sustainable um, and endanger, endangering those practices um, when it comes to fishing and those practices of connection with um, the ocean and land as well. So just wanted to add that. Yeah. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit about that um, documentary. It sounds fascinating. But I think just to add to that point, um, you know, one of the, the sort of driving forces in the defeat, well, hopefully defeat might not be long term, um, of Shell's effort to do offshore drilling, uh, you know, up, up the, the west coast and the eastern coast of, of South Africa, you know, a lot of that was driven by traditional fishing, fish, fishing people. So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, they, they're often, as in the Impolosia area, they're often in that kind of interface and front line between these massive oil companies. It's precisely the indigenous people who have connection to the land and to the spaces that are actually fighting. Um, and, you know, they, they play such a critical role, but, but they, they've been so attacked and uh, you know under attack for, by, by all these forces um i just want to step off that f 
for um, well actually okay before I step up that just very quickly uh you the the whole issue of um sort of western science and because the this person in your documentary you, you speak of as a scientist as well as a songoma um but they're kind of uh interesting walk between western science on the other hand and indigenous knowledge systems which I think is something that's kind of really coming to the fore. And of course, it's something that that is very relevant to African writers. Um, can you maybe just talk a little bit about that in in terms of the sort of current climate change issues and ecological justice issues? Um, I think I was interested to tell the story um... I'll, I'll go straight to the beginning of, of how I ended up making um, or telling this particular story. Um, Generation Africa, the program I'm making this documentary through, we're looking for climate change stories that are both decolonial and character driven. Um, and I'd read about um, Dr. Moakabo Rahashwa, um, who's a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, sort of one of the first black women to get um, a physical oceanography degree. Um, so a pioneer in that way, but also the year she was sort of defending her PhD, she started having the dreams and visions that indicated that she had an ancestral calling. Um, so she went through her training as, as a Sangoma, as a traditional healer, the same year she wrapped up her oceanography PhD. And I found that that synergy of what people argue are opposing, um, things people love to oppose spirituality and science and say that these two things are not connected um and i think we'd live in a very different system especially in south africa if there was an attempt to actually integrate um indigenous practice with sort of science um and what i've really loved about working with her as a scientist is her deep appreciation of the fact that she often says small scale fishes um they saw everything and they sort of sounded the alarm and scientists give the data to things that they've understood for a very long time. Um, and in terms of her work as a Sangomet, it's all about a sacred connection to the ocean. Um, and she talks about trying to do the dance of the ocean as an investigative space and the ocean as this space of like communing and of mystery. Um, so I feel like she embodies, um, a really interesting lens on climate change that actually embodies both the scientific lens and the indigenous spiritual lens. Um, and, and it's, it always makes me think of, uh, a sign that I saw at a protest that said, um, indigenous justice is climate justice. Um, and I think recognizing those knowledge systems is particularly powerful for someone who understands both both sides of the coin. Yeah, that, I think that that is such an interesting area, and it's. I mean, I'm very excited about that documentary. It sounds amazing. Um, I've just had a, a a couple of people are wanting to know. I know this is slightly off topic, but but uh, Uche, you, I, I think you've written a, a children's story about. Um, addressing the, the, the sort of ecological issues. Um, I wonder if you or anyone else on the panel has got any comment on on good children's literature that that looks at explores some of the issues of ecological justice or injustice. So um, actually, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead. The a book that popped to mind, um, I think it's called the the Black Mermaid, and it's about um, Zandi, who's the um, a black woman who's become like a really well known um, free dive um, free diver, and I think again, sort of this idea of restoring. Um, like people feeling like the ocean belongs to them too um and as a space for them too so that's the children's book that popped into mind um just wanted to add that 
Um, I used to work for a. Go ahead. Sorry, Janelle. Oh, sorry. You have. Yeah, you you had something. Um, yeah, we were actually in the chat. I think Uche and I were throwing in some ideas. Um, uh, I used to work for a publisher in Nigeria um, back in the Kasava Republic Press, and they um, uh, looking. I don't think it's available now, sadly, but it was a series of children's books <clears throat> based around the Millennium Development Goals by Fatima Akilu. And one of them explicitly talked about, you know, getting children involved in civic education and the environment. The one I think that is still there and still available um, is another book by um, Virginia DK, who is um, a teacher um, and Nigeria, uh, she's American Nigerian. Um, and um, it's about, it's a guide to birds of, of West Africa. So it is a um, a way of getting young of children, getting children invested in their environment by teaching them how to identify local birds. And I've always found that one great step to having children feel a connection to the environment, to environmental issues is by teaching them about what their environment looks like. So what kinds of trees are surrounding them, what kinds of local wildlife they can spot um and i uh so it's not so much explicitly dealing with like environmentalism but it is an appreciation of the environment which is where i think all these kinds of of um all that should start from i'm sorry i wasn't on mute this whole time right okay <laughs> Uh, Bridget, I think we might have lost you on audio. Can you still hear us? Can you hear me? I just, I was, I'm struggling to hear Chanela. Uh, yes, we can hear you now. I think. Um, yeah, I think that might be, we might actually need to wrap up anyway. So that might be kind of a perfect segue. Um, if, is there any last minute question or anything like that? Do you want okay. to say anything, Bridget? No, that's right. No, I think, I think it's okay. My, my trackpad is sort of stopped. I can't read any questions in the chat anyway. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't get the end of what Chanela said. Um, but yeah, I think just to wrap up, I mean, there, there's been so many fruitful, you know, it's it's been my, my, the hardest task has been to to kind of keep the conversation moving because every at every point I want to just dive in and and spend an hour kind of teasing out some of those points. Um, so I think, I mean, I just would, you know, really love to thank everybody. This has been an absolutely fascinating and fantastic panel. And also some of you, I, I knew as authors before, some I didn't. So, uh, you know, I, I've been really delighted to have the opportunity to, to get to know your work a little bit. Um, and I think it's such a critical area. I think, you know, I think African writers are really poised, poised to make a contribution to, to literature in, in this field. Uh, but I just wanted to say thank you all. I'm actually very blown away by this conversation. Um, you guys all contributed so many insights. And Bridget, thank you for the wonderful questions. And thank you to all of the audience members for attending. We're also going to uh, put the recording up online. So if you want to go back and listen to this again, I definitely know that I will be. I feel like I need to listen to this a couple times because there were so many amazing things um, coming up in conversation. And, and I really think that we could, like you said at the beginning, Bridget, we could chat for four hours about this. So um, yeah, thank you all so much for attending. I really appreciate it to all the panelists and Bridget, our moderator. Thank you guys. Thanks to the African Climate Alliance um, for co-hosting this. We missed you, Sarah. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can all keep in touch and keep this conversation going in the future.